welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's podcast episode is looking at tooth whitening in orthodontics. Now this common cosmetic procedure was recently described at a British orthodontic conference and in it it stated that perhaps we should consider tooth whitening as part of orthodontic finishing, which got my curiosity about this topic. So today's episode reviews the topic of tooth whitening and we've gone down in particular to what can be involved in orthodontics when it comes to both aligners, retainers and fixed appliances and the interaction with tooth whitening. To recap, the podcast is the opinion piece of myself and the orthodontics and summary team. It is our independent work. So how common is it? Well, one in four adult patients have some form of tooth whitening that takes place. How does it work? Well, essentially it, it's bleaching which involves a chemical change to darker staining within the dentition called chromogens. And the idea is that active agent, hydrogen peroxide, has an oxidizing reaction to these darker chromogens. They react, they oxidize, and they become a lighter compound as a consequence. Now, hydrogen peroxide itself is not a stable compound. So it comes in the form of carbamide peroxide which when mixed with water breaks down to around about a third of it becoming hydrogen peroxide itself. It's really interesting to look at the variation within clinical practice for tooth whitening. For example, in the UK, the absolute limit is 6% hydrogen peroxide, which is around 16% carbon peroxide. However, if we look at the US, actually they use 10% hydrogen peroxide for home bleaching and actually 35% for in-office bleaching, a massive variation in what is accepted practice. What about for our demographics, the young children? Well, where do we stand in that respect? Again, the UK take quite a strict approach. The patient has to be 18 and over to have tooth whitening unless it's designed to prevent or treat a specific disease. In the US last year, the American Association of Pediatric Dentistry stated that actually it was a safe and effective mechanism to treat discolored teeth. And they recommended that primary teeth and mixed dentition don't have tooth whitening that takes place. Apart from that, it is an acceptable and advised treatment for those indicated patients. What are the risks of tooth whitening? Well, sensitivity is the biggest one. 80% of patients will experience some form of sensitivity. And this tends to occur at the exact time of treatment and for the first few days. The most vulnerable tooth tends to be the upper lateral incisor. There's a direct correlation with the concentration and the amount of sensitivity patients have and the greatest intensity seems to be on teeth that are restored. Gingival irritation takes place as well when it comes to tooth whitening. This starts usually a few days afterwards and again lasts for several days. But the area by far of the greatest dental health risk of tooth whitening is does it increase the susceptibility to demineralization? Does decay and caries take place if teeth are whitened? And there is some logic behind this. The process of tooth whitening is highly acidic and that makes contact to the tooth surface for a significant period of time. What's been found overall in Tomkin's paper in 2014, there was no meaningful increase when it came to the demineralization risk for patients when it came to using even 35% hydrogen peroxide as long as manufacturers guidelines were followed. Now, if aggressive whitening takes place, i.e. exceeding the time the manufacturer recommended, actually it can result, according to Xi's paper from 2012, into increase of demineralization. It's important this is a risky substance and actually the rec recommendations of manufacturers are the key to keeping it safe. How long does tooth whitening last? Well, this is an interesting one. Well, it really varies in the literature depending on the patient's lifestyle and their age and the initial color. But generally, it's around six to 12 months. The patient will have color which is stable with respect to the changes that take place. What about when it comes to the orthodontic interaction with tooth bleaching? Well, let's start off with aligners. The aligner tray is fundamentally different to the bleaching tray. Bleaching trays tend to include two millimeters of gingival extension. Aligners tend to be gin gingivally cut. The material is different as well. It tends to be a soft acetate for bleaching trays whereas aligners tend to be some form of a, of a stiffer plastic which is used. Now, it's interesting that the components of a bleaching tray have been indicated to allow a tighter seal to take place to prevent leaking off the actual bleach material onto the gingiva. Now, when it comes to looking at the aligners, actually, even though gingivally beveled and less stiffness at the gingival aspect, there appears to be no difference 
when it comes to looking at the bleaching effectiveness by using an aligner tray and a bleaching tray using the same material. That's the LEAM study from 2021. Now, what about when it comes to sensitivity and gingival irritation? Again, there appears to be no significant increase that prevents or reduces treatment effectiveness. That's Lorini's study from 2020. 2020. How much gel should be used? Well, according to bleaching trays and aligner trays, it seems to be the same. Two millimeters of thickness. Whether it's placed at the incisal aspect or in the middle of the facial aspect, it seems to be equally effective at doing it. So it seems to work quite well for aligners to be used as bleaching trays. What about the attachments? Do the attachments stop bleaching taking place? Does it result in reduced effectiveness of the actual bleach? Really interesting to state it makes no difference to the overall outcome. Now this is an interesting idea that actually even with the attachment on, the hydrogen peroxide can diffuse underneath the attachment. It gets in between the enamel prism prisms and therefore effectively bleaches the surface underneath. Now, the composite can reduce, res result in slightly less effectiveness of how much that bleach will penetrate into the enamel. However, when it comes to removing the, the attachment, the polishing itself results in a reduction in this colour differential to the degree that nobody can tell the difference. And that's a really interesting Staley study from 2004. What about using retainers in the same way? Well, a study looking at the use of 0.8 millimetres Zendura showed that it's as effective as using a bleaching tray. So again, we've got different types of trays within orthodontics that can be utilised for tooth whitening. However, the difference with the use of a retainer is that it does have changes to its biomechanical properties. There's a reduction in the tensile strength. And there's an increase in the, in the hardness of the material itself. Now, this was from Jin's study, which just came out in 2024. The question still is, what are the long-term effects of that to the use and wear and ultimately the stability of that retainer, we do not know. So the question mark when it comes to using the retainer as the bleaching tray. What about the bond strength? Well, this was an interesting study that took place by Miguel in 2006, and it showed that bleaching itself results in a reduction of the enamel bond strength by up to 25%. And the recommendation is to wait at least two weeks from the completion of the actual tooth whitening before bonding to the actual tooth surface. Now that begs the question in my mind, when should we place our bonded retainers? Should we also wait for two weeks prior to placing our bonded retainers and the completion of our tooth whitening. Unfortunately, there's no evidence which has looked into this particular aspect of bonding. And the final thing to bear in mind is for fixed appliances, tooth whitening can be an effective component to utilize with the brackets still on. The downsides are the literature seems to be split when it comes to the color difference. In some literature, it states that you can still tell the difference from where the bracket has been, and other literature states that difference is relatively small, we're still waiting for more reliable evidence to come out. I think this is a really interesting topic and we find patients of all ages and walks of life asking more about tooth whitening and hopefully this podcast has given you some more information with some more questions to answer about when we actually place our bonded retainers and should we really use it with fixed appliances in place. A quick update for me, well I've been out in Saudi Arabia delivering the IPR course and lectures. I never thought IPR would be of such interest but it's wonderful to be invited by the Orthodontic Society out there in Saudi Arabia to deliver the content. Looking forwards now, I have an interview prepared with the wonderful Roxana Pertru from Romania where we discuss the topic of TMD, that grey area, and see where we stand in clinical practice at this point in time and what we can do as clinicians when it comes to managing this condition as orthodontists. Wishing everybody well. That brings a wrap to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.